So we're using a bacteria that prevents these mosquitoes from from being able to carry dengue fever. That is fe- what what's the name what's the name of this bacteria? It's called Wolbachia. Wolbachia. Just the W. Yeah. Yeah, and it's pretty much my favorite. What uh, why is it <laughs> well, well why is Wolbachia your favorite bacteria? Uh, I guess number one is almost everywhere, it, and it does all these weird things. So Wolbachia um, lives in about a, a half of the world's insects. Like if you think of the last two insects you saw, um, or other arthropods, like if you saw a spider or if you saw a fly, there's a 50-50 chance that at least one one of them at least had Wolbachia in it. And so it's in all these different organisms, uh, millions of species of, of insects, um, including the beetles that I study. Okay. And um, it can cause these reproductive effects. Um, it can change who, in, who can breed with who. Um, Wolbachia can affect if a virus replicates or not inside a host, like the dengue example. Um, and so there's like these, these stories um, and abilities that, that, that group together. So Wolbachia plus its insect, like does something really fascinating that neither one of them is maybe so interesting on its own, Mm -hmm. but together, I think they make a really cool story. Um, And then to just be able to shuffle that um, and then have major effects on human disease is, is fascinating to me. Um, I remember going to, there is a Wolbachia research conference. I went to it about (laughs) um, 12 years ago. Uh huh. (laughs) And, um, and the scientists there, someone started presenting about this dengue thing and everyone's like, what the heck? Um, and it's amazing to see how it's, it's grown um, and is in use on multiple continents and, and a really effective way of controlling mosquitoes instead of using insecticides or um, maybe more expensive or sometimes less culturally acceptable um, approaches like genetic engineering. So it's kind of the middle ground. It's like a, another approach um, for that. That is, yeah, that's very fascinating. Um, do, are there any negative implications for using Wabakia in these mosquitoes? Like what would, and what would some of those be? Cause I mean, I, right? I'm a big proponent of, I mean, there's always some sort of biological hazard um, if we start monkeying around with the natural order of things. Yeah, yeah, and of course, these initial experiments were done in Australia, which is where many of these um, uh, something is re- is released to control another organism, like cane toads. Um, yeah, that's terrible. Um, I'm not sure how they got there. Yeah, then they take over, and you're like, oh God, why did we do that? Mm-hmm. That was so short sighted. Um, I mean, as far as we can tell, the I mean, Wolbachia is a normal bacteria that lives inside other insects, uh, other mosquitoes specifically, and the mosquitoes are pests. Um, they really only live around humans. Uh, these particular mosquitoes. So it doesn't seem like it. Um, initially with the design of which Wolbachia, because there are many, many, many different strains to use. Initially, it seemed like the bacteria that would be used could have caused um, a species to die out. Mm-hmm. But for mosquitoes, who cares, right? Like that would be great. Um, so so there, I think there's been some careful looking into that. And um I mean, for the most part, they basically, we still have the same mosquito. It's just that now this one has Wolbachia in it and the previous one didn't. So um, I'm not, it's not to say there's not consequences because that's impossible to predict. Uh, but I think the consequences are less than if we, um, we release a whole nother organism that could be eating so many things and reproducing kind of out of control. Um, this is because it's nested. It's like the nested, the Russian nesting dolls. Um, if we, if we still have the same doll that's on the outside, then does it really change a whole lot? Um, so yeah. So I, I think that, I think it'll be interesting to see. I'm optimistic. Um, over the period of time that that project's been going, that that there's not um, too ill of consequences. Yeah, that'll be so. You have to send me a paper on this because I, I, that's something that I'm I'm pretty interested. In, thing I'd love to follow. I mean, in in yeah. terms of like micro organisms, you know, you shared your favorite Wabaki. I got to share mine. Definitely got to be the tardigrade. Oh, yeah. The water bears. The oh water God. bears. I mean, they can survive the yeah. vacuum of space. Huge. What's up, John? Uh, water bears aren't I said, I said micro, microorganism. Um, I forget what. That's what I it's said. It's a microorganism. Yeah. It's technically, it's <clears throat> it's a micro animal. It's true. It's, 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 un, really it's in micro- the kingdom. It does have a lot of. 
shit. I was yeah. wrong. But Damn I do want to. I want to talk about yeah. water bears. Let's but, yeah. let's do it. Let's do it because they can survive yeah. the vacuum of space. They're you know that they, they're they're tough. They're tough little bastards. So so yeah. What what do you share with the listeners? Because you'll do a much better job than I can about about tardigrades and how awesome they are. Wow. Well, they are adorable. I mean, you have to use a very high-powered microscope to see them, and they do look like a little bear with that kind of a squashed face. Um, yeah, and they like to live in, as far as I understand, mosses yep. and lichens, and um, just like those, especially lichen, um, can withstand long periods of drying out, so can these little tiny animals. Um, I'm not sure their exact classification, um, but they're definitely multicellular. And, um, and yeah, they're, they're just adorable. And if you rehydrate, um, the, the environment that they're in, then they can also start to become metabolically active. So they're, yeah, they're just very charismatic. Very, they're very cute. <laughs> I agree. <Yeah. laughs> I spent an afternoon trying to find them when, one, one summer I was like, I want to find a water bear. So me and a biologist friend ran out and gra- got herself some lichen and spent a bunch of time looking under the microscope. We didn't find them. It was the dry season. Um, so uh, maybe they were there and we just missed them. But I, I definitely, I want to go scout some. Um, I would, I would use a badger too, though. <laughs> if I was going to look for a water bear. <laughs> what if they're together? What if they're hunting together? Yeah, I didn't even know. We would, we'd be able to see one. We wouldn't be able to see the other one. I know right? that would be the problem. Yeah, unless the badger could get really small but do, i don't i don't think so do you spend much time like uh i mean maybe not not so much now but like you know in the past did you ever look into animal behavior uh because that to me is like a really fascinating like part like i got obsessed with lions at one point like i didn't understand that they're like i can't remember the name of the the pride but there was a super pride of like or the coalition, excuse me, of like five male lions that took over this massive territory in like the early 2000s. Whoa. And they had like, th- you know, three or four prides of female lions. And they would all split up and like patrol the territory. And they, w- they were just, they were, it was super badass. I had no idea that that was what was going on in the savannah. And they had a pretty big following online and whatnot. But I mean, is that something, you know, in the past that you'd, you'd looked into? Um, not really, honestly. I'm on the exact opposite end of thing. I'm looking at like the tiny things. Like I like like the last couple summers, I dissect like little tiny beetles that are like as big as a pea. I dissect out their like testes and ovaries. Like that's <laughs> that's the what the kind of thing that I do <laughs> of dead beetles too. So like I'm a I'm a kind of a DNA biologist, I would say. Um, I mean, I think that that stuff is fascinating with animal behavior, but that, that's not something I've worked on so directly. What are these beetles? that you're dissecting and why? Oh, um, yeah. I like to call them the tiny, shiny beetles. Um, their name is Bambidian, and they are one of the most specious groups that we know of on the planet. So this is a genus, if you know the scientific naming system, like Homo sapiens, Homo is the genus, and then sapiens is the species. So Bambidian is the genus of beetles. There's about 1,200 different species that are known of these tiny, shiny beetles, and they live on the edge of water, like by rivers or lakes or sometimes by a glacier. Mm-hmm. And um, and they are, again, very small. M- many of them are shiny, um, and they come out at night usually, and then they will go like find little bits of dead insects um, or larvae that have washed up on the edge of the water. Um, and they can be found almost anywhere in the world. Um, uh, in intertidal areas in the ocean as well. And so um, I've been working on those for a while, and about half of the ones I've tested have Wolbachia. And so I'm trying to look for patterns of what's going on with the Wolbachia genetics um, and match that up with the beetle genetics to see if, um, yeah, they have some some shared history. Do you think that, like, in the instance of, you know, finding Wabaki, is this helping the beetles, like, that have Wabaki? Are they more successful? Like, if you're looking for patterns, I'm just, is that sort of what you're yeah. trying to piece together? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the way that I do it, because they're all dead, um, I work with a scientist at Oregon State University who's spent the last 20, 25 years collecting these beetles all around the world. So all of the ones that I look at are dead. Um, so I don't know any of their life history traits. That would be awesome. But um, but 
that would require living organisms in in the lab. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm actually looking for is so this Wolbachia bacteria seems to be able to potentially affect um, speciation, and so it could be responsible for some of the events of insect speciation that we see potentially hundreds of thousands of times that we've gotten different species I, I'm, are because of the Wolbachia. I'm a little bit unclear what speciation means. Right. Yeah, good question. So um, speciation would be if we had one group of organisms that was all in a population and they could all interbreed. Um, if over some period of time, um, it could be because like um, there's a river that forms between them. Now they can't um, breed with each other mm -hmm. physically. And then if you try to reintroduce them later, they've changed too much. Okay. So now they're separate. Um, and so, so insects are really fascinating because there are so many species of them compared to any other groups that we know of that was like, well, what, what caused that? Like, why do they keep splitting? And it, it seems possible, um, uh, that Wolbachia, this bacteria, um, because of its presence and it affects who can breed with who, which that's an interesting story as well. It could be the driver of how things start to split. What the fuck? So instead of like... For real? I know, right? That's wild. Yeah. So because of a bacteria, this is a hypothesis, right? This isn't this isn't fact. So that you're, founded, you're, but it, your yeah. hypothesis is because there is a bacteria that has infected these insects that it's gonna cause speciation, meaning it's gonna create a different type of species of beetle that all have Wolbachia. Well, that's kind of creepy. Yeah, it's totally creepy. Yeah, <laughs> it's not just mine. Yeah, so people have found um, over the last couple decades many examples where certain fruit flies can't breed with each other anymore. Like if you remove the Wolbachia, then they can't breed together. And they used to say, oh, it's just a parasite. It doesn't matter. But Wolbachia just keeps showing up in more and more lineages. And so it's it's possible that the presence or absence of it has allowed things to kind of uh, breed together or not, um, and start to split. What what advantage would it have for this bacteria to do this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so that's a really good question. So the way that it works is so Wolbachia is considered a reproductive parasite, and so basically just like a virus, it just wants to make more. That's how it benefits. Right? That's how it continues to spread. Mm -hmm. And no, and so um, Wolbachia lives inside females, um, female insects specifically in their ovaries, and then it can get packaged into the eggs, which means that every baby that that um, insect has will also be infected with Wolbachia. Mm. So it can spread like that through generations, and then where the reproductive bit comes in is really weird. Um, are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm excited. So, all right. If the female is infected, then she can always make babies. And it doesn't matter if the male has the, the uh, bacteria or not. But if a female doesn't have the bacteria, she, can, she can't make babies with an infected male. And so now she can't make any babies. And so her, basically her line could die out. Um, Whoa. I know, right? Yeah. It's nefarious. That is crazy. So the only way she can have reproduce is to get infected. Or if she finds a male, um, that, doesn't a male have. that doesn't have it. Yep. But, yeah. the, but, then but it's, it basically it's, sets up. Yeah. But it's 50-50, right? It's a 50-50 chance. Wabaki is and everything. Can we get it? Um, not that we know of. That's a good question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I don't want it. <laughs> I think it, yeah, I don't want it. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, basically Wolbachia can select for infected females. So that's the benefit. And then, um, and, but then it also as a downside, um, kind of starts to limit things. Um, so, and set up some barriers basically, which could cause that speciation. Okay. Now is this in... I know you don't study, you're studying dead animals, but I have to ask this question because it's top of mind right now. Does it change mm -hmm. the, if, does it change the, do you know, maybe a colleague or, or, or someone else in this field, right? Do you know of, it, of an, the animals that are, the insects that are infected? Is it, are there, is their behavior changing at all? If they have an infected yeah, rate of, of yeah. Wolbachia? That's a good question. Um, for these beetles, I don't think anyone would know, but there definitely are examples that people have looked at behavioral changes with Wolbachia. Um, I don't know the examples off the top of my head, but I definitely could dig around and find some. Um, but yeah, it could change behaviors. Um, I think it was in some ants 
or maybe wasps. Um, yeah. And um, another creepy thing that Wolbachia does, well, this is actually kind of cool. So Wolbachia infects bed bugs. Mm-hmm. Um, if you take the Wolbachia away, the bed bug dies. Oh, really? I know, right? Yeah. Because the Wolbachia can help with its nutrition because it eats such a weird diet of blood. Um, yeah. So so if we got rid of Wolbachia and bed bugs, we'd have no bed bugs. That's good. That'd be great. Yeah, that that is good. No. That's and this is it's, yeah. I, I didn't even it, it kind of freaks me out that I didn't know that this existed. I mean, uh, uh, although it doesn't seem to be a problem in human beings, um, right? Which is probably why I don't know about it. But it, it's it's going on in the insect world, which I mean, insects outnumber us. Like I don't even I feel like it's like twenty to one. They're everywhere. We're always finding new species of the creepy crawlies. Yeah. Well, and Wolbachia keeps making them. So there you go. Yeah, like, right. You just they can't keep, get away They keep from making yeah. different types of insects, which is, this is, this is <laughs> fascinating. How, I mean, how did you end up finding out about this? And like. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I worked on fruit flies in grad school um, and I looked at development of the nervous system. So, um, so I really liked fruit flies. I liked insects. And then um, I had a. Um, I worked for a little while in a laboratory that looked at corals and symbiosis. And I thought that was really cool. But then I got a job in Denver and I was like, okay, I'm not going to be near the ocean. This is going to be tricky to work on symbiosis. Um, And so I just decided to put the two projects together. So I was like, all right, so I like insects and I like symbiosis. So is there a bacteria that lives inside of insects? And um, a friend of mine from grad school had just started working on Wolbachia. It was like, hey, get on the train. <laughs> Let's go on the Wolbachia train. Wolbachia Express. Woo woo. Yeah. So, um, so that was about 12 or more years ago. And I just, then I, then I started, I kind of became a groupie, right? <laughs> I go to the Wolbachia meeting and um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had my students go out and collect whatever they can find. And then we look for Wolbachia in it. And um, yeah, I'm on the team. In- insects are fascinating um there and yeah there's so many stories and wolbachia's got this cool part of it that I, yeah i just i just think it's fascinating